wrestling in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore Safe to shore Safe to shore Safe to shore shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings With each morning I rise and sing My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore Safe to shore Safe to shore Safe to shore shore. Far before us You're the brightest You will lead us Through the storms Fire before us You're the brightest You will lead us Through the storms Fire before us You're the brightest You will lead us Through the storms Fire before us You're the brightest You will lead us Through the storms My lighthouse My lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you oh, My lighthouse My lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me Safe to shore Safe to shore Safe to shore Transfiguration Sunday it is here at Golden Grove Uniting Church. It's good to be amongst friends, isn't it? It's good to be in the presence of God, which is everywhere, including here. And it's great to be worshipping together. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you are here and that we glimpse every time we enter your presence we glimpse something of your glory we glimpse something of who you are we glimpse something of who we are because of you jesus we pray that we would see more and more in the light of who you you are today may you open our minds open our hearts to see you as you really are and to see who we are the incredible people you've made us to be as a result of our relationship with you, all a gift of grace. We commit our time to you in great anticipation. Amen. (coughs) While we come in great hope today, it's been a bit of a challenging week, hasn't it? There's been uh, shocking news again around the world. We never know what's going to come. We'll talk more about that uh, in our time of prayer.
prayer, but right now as we sing the days of Elijah, uh, we do that again with our eyes open to what these days are. Let's pray. Uh, sorry, let's stand and sing. And we got, we've got two songs. We're going to finish. We're, we're then, then going to go on and sing Crown Him With Many Crowns. The Days of Elijah. Stand. <laughs> It is, he is Lord, Lord of, Lord of history, Lord of us, Lord of the church. Let's sing.
going to pray again. Our Lord, we sing all hail, Redeemer, hail, because you have died for me, you have died for us, and you have risen again as a stamp of life, an assurance that we too will follow in life as you have done. Lord, that there is great hope for us, but only because what you have, of what you have done. And in the light of that, we come confessing this morning again that we haven't always lived up to who we are, who we have been made to be in Christ. And this week we have lived at points and often selfish lives, lives turned in on ourselves instead of lives that look up to you and look out to others. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit again to be renewed in life now as we come to worship and in faith this week to live as you have called us to, to live the lives that you have called us to live and that you empower us to live. Lord, we need you every hour. We need you and we need you now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We serve a great God, a great, great God. And uh, we're going to sing How Great Is Our God, a song we know well to a music video now. Let's stand and do that. the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how our God and all will see how great how great is our God age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end God. 
see how great, how great is our God. We have a lot of voices in our ears these days, don't we? If you just scan at the moment who we listen to, how do we know who we listen to? So we've got a, you might have noticed, did you notice there's a state election coming up? Um, you might have noticed <laughs> that things have changed around the place and there are, our letterbox is being, is chock full, even though we have Australia Post only a thing on our letterbox. We, our letterbox is chock full of messages from people who want us to listen to them. And for those of you with smartphones, if you've got various apps and social media, there's all kinds of messages screaming through our social media pages. And if you have flipped on the news at all this week, there's a whole lot of other messages. I know certainly when I was growing up, my parents would often say, you need to listen to what we're saying. They're probably right. And as a school teacher, I've caught myself <coughs> teaching essay writing this week in Year 10 English, saying, guys, you need to listen to this. It's really important. So I'm also using the same phrase, listen to me. But isn't that... We, there are so many competing voices, aren't there, saying, listen to me. So how do we know where to listen, to really listen and to take heed? Well, later in the service, Krista Brenny is going to bring us a reading. And in that reading, you're going to hear a voice from the clouds. And it was this, when Jesus was on the mountain of the Transfiguration, amazing story, tune into that one, won't you? And there's a voice from the clouds that said, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Now, that was said to Peter, John and James but it's just as much said to us. Listen to Jesus. Listen to his words. How do we do that? Well, we're doing it now today. We do it every time we open the word of God individually or in our Bible study groups. We do it when we tune in to the word of God spoken through other people. Listen to him. Really listen. Really listen to him. So... In all the competing voices and a lot of noise right now, I'm encouraging myself as much as I encourage you. Listen to him. We have, um, there are all, all kinds of notices in your bulletin. Make sure you read those. I particularly want to warmly welcome any visitors who are with us today. You are, we are thrilled that you chose to join us. And uh, we hope that you will stay and have a cup of tea and a biscuit after service or coffee. And uh, please remember when we are having morning tea to keep the chairs where they are. We need to follow COVID rules, even though restrictions have eased a little bit. Masks need to be firmly on, thanks, unless you're actually eating or drinking. So let's do that so that we can keep having a morning tea and a chance to actually connect. Are there any other notices this morning? There are some uh, flyers for Cafe Youth uh, for the program for Term 1. I think there's some uh, at the entrance of the church and some out in the hall as well. So uh, feel free to grab one of those, pass them on to anyone who may be interested. That's for 14 and up Cafe Youth. Cafe Church tonight, 6pm here in the church hall. Uh, contemporary style of worship, a relaxed atmosphere, tea and coffee available. Still doing BYO snacks for that, but 6 p.m. tonight in the hall. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. We're coming to our prayers 
for others and for the world now. And as we begin that, uh, we've been sent a particular prayer for the Ukraine, some of which I'm going to read uh, for us to lead us this morning. Uh, there's a particular call for prayer uh, this Tuesday, 8 o'clock Sydney time, 8 p.m., which is 7.30 hour time. So if we want to join the chorus around the world for prayer. But of course, our prayer for the Ukraine and for our world is not confined to that. But please, please, let's pray for this a new uncertainty, really scary uncertainty in so many ways. So I'm going to pray with parts of this red prayer and then you know what the drill is. We're going to pray more generally for our world and there's space for you to to quietly or, or loudly call out the names and situations that God has laid on your heart. Let's pray. Father God, King of all nations, we cry out to you now for the people of Ukraine. We ask you to rescue those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies, that they may live without fear before you all their days. Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace, our politicians are predicting the biggest war in Europe since 1945. And we simply cry out to you urgently to write another story in our time. Thwart the dark machinations of evil men. Give wisdom beyond human wisdom to peacemakers seeking an equitable and less violent way. May politicians exercise the wisdom from above which is peaceable gentle, willing to yield and full of mercy. Holy Spirit, we pray for the church in Ukraine, a nation in which 70% of the population call themselves Christian. Give our many brothers and sisters in that nation courage in this crisis that they may proclaim the good news of your kingdom, bind up broken hearts and bring comfort to all who mourn. You, Lord, make wars cease to the end of the earth. You break bows, shatter spears, and burn shields with fire. And so we ask you now to save the lives of many people in Ukraine. Make a peace that is strong and not weak. De-escalate the crisis. We hear of wars and rumours of wars in Matthew. But you, Lord, are our rock, our fortress, and our deliverer. Our hope is in you. And so we address the nations now in the name of Jesus. We say, be still and know God. He is exalted among the nations. He shall be exalted in the earth. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us and grant us peace. Lord, we pray for mercy for the people of Ukraine. We pray for mercy for all of those affected by this new war, including us, because there is a, a grief and a fear in all of us as we watch the news and see the horror of what is happening there. Lord, may we too be still and know that you are God still, especially now. Lord, we think of other areas of our world too that are in turmoil. There are so many. And we forget. We forget them. We think of Queensland, South East Queensland. We think of Afghanistan. We think of our own political world here with state and federal elections coming soon. May your will be done. And Lord, we think too of the people and situations that you have laid on our hearts and we speak them now. All of these prayers we pray in the name of the one who makes every bit of difference, the King of the universe, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
We're going to stand and sing one of my favourite hymns, Before the Throne of God, above, which speaks of the great, the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And during this, your offering will be received. Thank you. for the offering before I invite Chris to come up with a reading. Thanks. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are all good, that you are all grace, that you are a generous God and so you give and give and give. And we give today. We give you our time and worship. We give you these tithes and offerings. We give you our lives because we can give you nothing less. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36, the Transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, (coughs) Moses and Elijah, excuse me, appeared in glorious splendour, <coughs> excuse me, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, It is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. 
A voice came from the clouds saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Chris. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, well, one day as, as people made their way to work on the Portuguese island of Madeira, they saw this in the sky above the trees and houses. We hopefully just have a, have a uh, picture come up there for us now. Um, and uh, believe it or not, that's a cloud formation, simply reflecting the sun's light in the very early morning. Apparently... Uh, the low-angled rays of light at that time cause an effect called light scattering, which produces these amazing colours. Uh, some people said that it looked like a giant flaming comet about to smash into the earth. Uh, others said they thought it was like the hand of God reaching out to the people of Madeira. I can kind of see both, but in any case, it's, it's certainly stunning. And... Uh, there's some similarity between this and the story of the transfiguration of Jesus in Luke 9, uh, which also involves a cloud, a glorious radiance, uh, and in this case, the voice of God. But uh, Jesus is with his friends. We'll just leave that there for a, a moment. Uh, Jesus is with his friends on the top of the mountain where they went to pray, and then suddenly Jesus' appearance changes and he shines with brilliant white light so dazzling they can hardly look at it. Uh, but there's a radical difference between the events on Madeira and the Mount of Transfiguration. As amazing as the, this uh, cloud formation is, uh, as soon as the sun's angle changed, it just turned into a lump of grey cabbage-shaped cloud. Uh, it only, the only glory it had was a reflected <coughs> glory. With Jesus' transfiguration, the light, the glory, is coming out of Jesus. He's the source of it. It belongs to him. So uh, what does that mean for Jesus and for us? Uh, that photo can come down now. Thanks, uh, Rickard. And uh, that's what we need to explore this morning, uh, looking at uh, what the transfiguration has to tell us, firstly, about who Jesus is, secondly, what he came to do, and thirdly, how that connects with our lives. So what's the transfiguration say to us about who Jesus is? Well, uh, a cloud of dazzling light isn't a new thing in the Bible. It's what the Old Testament called uh, the Shekinah, or the glory cloud. And uh, this cloud appeared at certain times. And it represented God's very presence. And uh, it accompanied the children of Israel through the desert in the Exodus. Uh, it appeared as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It also appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. And when Moses came down from the mountain from seeing the glory cloud, his face shone too uh, so that the people could hardly look at it. But Again, unlike Jesus, Moses' radiance was only a, a borrowed, reflected glory, like the cloud on Madeira uh, had, it, had borrowed its brilliance from the sun and soon faded. But Jesus is the sun. The dazzling light comes out of him. Hebrews 1 says that 
Uh, God revealed himself through many prophets in the past, but in Jesus Christ, the radiance of God's glory uh, is, uh, he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is not just another prophet trying to get closer to God. He is God. And up to this point in Jesus' ministry, there's been a huge question hanging in the, in the air. Who is this Jesus? You know, he who uh, heals the sick, befriends the outcast, forgives sins, promises eternal life. But if he's just another religious leader or a charlatan, then um, it's going to have no lasting substance or value. It's just another passing sideshow. But if he is the eternal creator and redeemer himself, then that changes absolutely everything. Then what he says and does has eternal substance. It will last forever. It will fill us with the greatest hope that's indestructible and it will totally transform our lives now if that's true. We either believe in the fully supernatural divine Jesus or we think he's something less than that. Uh, maybe a good man who said a lot of good things about God but if that is what we believe, then in the end, he's just no different from any of us. And the value of his words and actions are just going to die with him. In which case, if that's how it is, we are just left with fading life, decaying, and we're in the process of losing everything that really matters to us in life. Forever. Happy Christmas. That's why churches who hold to the supernatural Jesus of the Bible, the majority of them are outside the Western world, they are growing like crazy. And that's why churches that have given up on the supernatural Jesus and replaced him with a mere good man who talks a bit of religion the majority of them are in the Western world, they are dying. That's how crucial it is. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit of a strange story. A warning here. Uh, it's one I only very rarely tell, uh, and on the occasion I think it might serve the gospel. I had an experience when I was 20 years old. I had grown up as a Christian, but wasn't one then, and I hadn't been for some time. I was with some friends late one night, and we were under the influence of drugs. And I was having a conversation with a particular friend, and I know this is going to sound really weird, but in the middle of it, something happened. And my friend started speaking to me in the first person as Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, just as though he were Jesus Christ talking to me. Now, I know what, you were think what you're thinking. Hey, you were on drugs. Of course you thought he was Jesus Christ. But no, it wasn't like that. And uh, honestly, this was something that broke right through the effect of any drugs. And I was stone cold sober when this happened. I somehow knew that I was being met by Jesus and spoken to by him. And that this was real. And he told me of his great love for me in spite of everything that he had a good plan for my life and was wanting me to come back to him and direct my life in his way, including not using drugs. The next morning, I woke up uh, 
excited and I rushed to my friend to talk to them about this amazing thing that had happened the night before. But to my astonishment, he knew not a thing about it. But I absolutely knew the, the, the central effect was that I knew that Jesus was real. He was there. He was in my world. He was in my life. I could not get away from him. I knew that he was God, that he was the redeemer and Lord of all who loved me and that I had to reckon with him. I had to come to terms with him. I struggled with that for some time, but within the next year I was totally converted or reconverted to faith in Jesus Christ and became his follower. Now, a couple of uh, important qualifying comments need to go with that story. Firstly, uh, regarding that foolish phase in my life, what I take to be uh, pretty obvious, but if you use drugs, they will do lasting damage to you. And that's if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, they can kill you. So first point, don't touch them. Second point, in that experience, nothing more happened to me than simply what has to happen to every single one of us. That is, Jesus reveals himself to us as God and Lord so that we have to reckon with that in our lives. Now, that may equally happen on a mountain where Jesus, Moses and Elijah appear in dazzling light or when you are having a cup of tea in your living room, reading every day with Jesus and nothing out of the ordinary appears to happen at all. The important point is that we personally have that revelation of who Jesus is, that he is God. And that can and must happen for all of us. It'll come as it did with Jesus' disciples when they are reading and thinking about God's truth, his word, and praying. So do that. Jesus promises to do all the rest. Trust him. So that's who Jesus is, God. Uh, Now two, and my second and third points will be briefer than the first. But what did Jesus come to do? And the thing with God's presence is, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, it's lethal. The Bible says no one can see him and live. As I said, we looked at this recently and we need to look at it again. Firstly, because every human being struggles with this truth. And uh, secondly, because it's incredibly important. Some might wrongly think that this is just a bit of a nasty view about God, you know, that just belongs to the Old Testament, the idea of a God of judgment. But that misunderstands both God's judgment, which is full of love, And it misunderstands his love, which has his truth and judgment at its core. And both New Testament and Jesus acknowledge the truth that human beings cannot themselves survive the presence of God. Really, it's just physics. What would happen if if an elephant sat on you? God's being is simply too great for ours to bear. It would crush us. He is the eternal God and creator. We are the creature made of dust. He is the holy God with burning moral purity. We are sinners. And so seeing and touching God without anything in between to protect or mediate for us would overwhelm and destroy us. In the Old Testament tabernacle, God's presence was symbolised in what was called the Holy of Holies, which was separated off by a big thick curtain as protection for the people. All cultures in the world seem to understand this, 
apart from the postmodern West. In the West, we see God as lightweight, as easy to approach. What did Croc Dundee say? God's me mate. Easy to approach. You see, we've domesticated God. In fact, almost like a pet. And, you know, in fact, in the West, we even feel entitled before God. Even think he should be thankful that we notice him. That's how it's got. But anyone who seriously seeks and approaches God sooner or later finds themselves morally and spiritually undone. Now in the transfiguration, the glory of God's presence is revealed to the disciples and guess what? They live. Not only that, it says that they are taken into, they're enveloped by the glory cloud. They somehow actually get to become a part of that divine glory, get to share in it. This is truly astounding. And so we see Peter kind of freaks out. He says to Jesus, oh, shall we build three tabernacles, one for you, Moses and Elijah? You see, he, he's still thinking about protecting themselves from the divine glory. Let's put it in a tabernacle. Uh, he's thinking, you see, this has is, is got to be too good to be true. But no, it's absolutely true. How? In verse 31, it says that Moses and Elijah who appear there are talking with Jesus about his departure, which he is about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, the word translated as departure there is a Greek word that every one of us know very well. It's the word, the Greek word, exodus. Exodus. Do you see what this is saying? Where Moses led the original exodus, Jesus will lead the new ultimate exodus. Where Moses freed Israel from oppression and slavery, Jesus will free all people from sin and death forever. And as it says, as it says he did this in Jerusalem. When he suffered and was put to death on the cross to pay for, cancel, and forgive all our sins, to defeat all evil and death for us, to raise us from the dead to eternal life in a glorious new heaven and earth. In other words, to deliver us from all bondage. Exodus. And Matthew records how at the moment of Jesus' death, the great curtain in the temple surrounding the Holy of Holies, separating the people from the presence of God, tore in two. Our full access into the glory of God's presence was secured. Just as Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, has full access to that glorious presence, so do we, Jesus exchanged glory, beauty, holiness for humiliation, ugliness, and our sin so that we might be made glorious, beautiful. The transfigured became disfigured so that the disfigured, us, might become transfigured. Do you see what this means? What we are looking at in the stunning transfiguration of Jesus is a mirror. We're seeing our true selves. Glorified humanity. <clears throat> what Jesus came to do. Now three, and very briefly, how's that connect with our lives? Well, first, 
obedience. You know, if Jesus is Lord of the universe, we must utterly submit our lives to him, let him direct all aspects of our lives. There's no part way Christianity. It's either the whole hog or nothing. So think about the points in our lives where we are disobedient to him. Prayerfully turn around and seek him. Receive his glory. He's holding it out to you. And obey him. Why wouldn't we? How could we not? Secondly, how the transfiguration connects with our lives, worship. How beautiful is the transfiguration? And I don't just mean the spectacle, but especially the grace that was poured out for us there. Do we come to church out of duty? Or do we come because we desire God? Think of what we most enjoy doing in life. What grabs most of our time and energy? Is God more than that to us? He needs to be and he can be. Gaze more into the beauty of the gospel. Duty will be overcome by desire. Thirdly, how the transfiguration connects with us Hope-filled patience. Jesus goes from the supreme glory of the transfiguration to go through the utter darkness of the cross in order to accomplish forgiveness, resurrection from the dead, a new heaven and earth, glory. And Christ promises to lead us through that same journey. Are you in any struggle, pain or darkness? Well, Jesus promises to take it all and to lead you and to work in you to fulfil his glorious purpose for your life through all of that. Trust him totally to do that. And let him lift and carry you. It can transform our lives with hope-filled patience. Amen. We're going to sing... uh, Great song now, a uh, great hymn about the transfiguration. God, you are clothed with light. And remembering from what we've heard in God's word, what that means is we know that, we trust that, means we too are clothed with that light. God, you are clothed with light. <laughs>
we'll just remain standing for the benediction, uh, which comes from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And uh, just before we sing our benediction song, you're invited to morning tea after the service in the hall. Um, if there's anybody who would like prayer for healing or any other need, there is somebody uh, can meet with you at the front of the church uh, at the end of the service to pray with you. Our benediction song may be a bit of an unusual one to have for a benediction song, but we're doing it in light of the focus on the transfiguration today. And we're just going to sing the first chorus, a verse and chorus only, of shine, Jesus shine, as he indeed does, and as he causes us to, and may we take that with us into this day and week. Shine, Jesus shine. Jesus Christ. 